this term A of Xn plus sum of log of that d phi t of xi. All right, and so now what I'm claiming is that what's in the inside this exponent is e essentially some fluctuations. Because you see this a term is the integral of a certain, uh, okay. Let me retrace my steps a little bit. I want to modify this term a little bit. So I look at this term, this a, um, and I observe that what I'm integrating here is a function, psi of x minus psi of y over x minus y, which is actually regular if psi is, uh, say, c1 or c2, because when x goes to y, this will go to the derivative of psi. So this function is actually regular, but I'm integrating in the complement of the diagonal. So what I can do is I can put back the diagonal and write it as, let me call it psi hat of x, y, the fluct of x, fluct of y, plus the diagonal terms that, or minus the diagonal terms that I put in there, and you can check, it's not too difficult, that those diagonal terms are going to be related to the derivatives um, at uh, at the point, so with a plus or a minus, I don't remember. Yeah, so it should be this. Okay, and that psi hat is just this function psi of x minus psi of y divided by x minus y. All right, so what's, what's happening to this term? This term is actually going to go together with the Jacobian because if I uh, linearize again that of d phi t, phi t is identity plus c prime, uh, identity plus t c prime, so when I linearize the log det, or in 1D the det, uh, I just get some of psi primes. So this can again be rewritten as the expectation. Of something where I'm going to get one minus beta over two, the sum of the psi prime i with a t. So this is what the term should give, if I'm not mistaken, with the signs. And then I get this guy, plus t. So it comes with a minus beta over 2. So still in the exponent, times t, times this term, let me call it b, or double integral of uh, psi hat d flux d flux. Okay, so now I'm claiming that I can evaluate those terms. The first term you see here, I'm summing a certain function against um, Dirac masses, right? So I can write this first term as exponential one minus beta over two times t times the integral of c prime against the equilibrium measure. And that would come with an n. Because that's my approximation of some of the Dirac's. So I can take this out of the integral. And then inside the expectation, I can put back the fluctuation uh, with a minus. So the, this one will have a minus, I think. No, that's good. 
Okay, so you see when I compute psi prime against the fluctuation, I regain this term minus the term I took out of the integral. So this is computable. And the other one is here. It's also computable. All right, so my claim is that <laughs> everything that's in the expectation is actually negligible, or it will be like one, uh, and that the leading term is this one that just came out. So we have to look at what's inside the expectation. It's the exponential moments of some integrals of fluctuations. And now, I remind you what we proved yesterday. We proved that if I have a test function and I integrate it against the fluctuation, I can control this essentially by the integral of fn plus n over d log n to the power 1 half. And in addition, the exponential moments of fn plus n log n, I always control them by n. So this is exactly what I need here, because I'm dealing with something against the fluctuation, so something regular enough. So that's if phi is Lipschitz. And here I have a t. Um, yeah. All right, so what is going to be the size of this guy? Well, let's say I can bound it by root n, typically, in an exponential moment. So the exponential of this t c prime fluct I will be able to bound by t and uh, is that what I want? No, sorry. So I will say square root of n. No. So this thing I essentially control it by um, something that's like square root of n. And when t is of order like order tau over n, if you remember I had to take t of order tau over n, this goes to zero. So this term actually does not contribute once you take uh, its expectation. And then we have the second term. The second term I'm trying to look at the exponential moments of something of the form t times some constant times this double integral of psi hat of xy, deflect of x, deflect of y. But now I can use again this, this, uh, this control. I can use it twice. Right, I'm integrating twice. So I can expect that this is going to be controlled by C fn plus n over d log n. Because here I have a square root and I use it twice, so it's going to make it appear with a square. And the exponential moments of that I control by n, but here I have a t. So the, the log of this, so sorry, I should take the logs. This is a log, here there's a log. So the log of this expectation, I finally bound by Tn. But T is of order 1 over n, so this is of order 1. OK, so this is the end of the computation. Now we retrace our steps. And we look at what we've done. We've computed the ratio of the partition functions. We've obtained some term here that is 
explicit that comes out of the integral multiplied by, so this term, by the way, since Tn is of order one, this is of order one, multiplied by something whose expectation is essentially of order one. Okay, so we plug that back into the computation of the Laplace transform, and we remember that the ratio of these partition functions up to uh, some constant factor is the Laplace transform of the fluctuations. So we have obtained the first step that the Laplace transform is of order one, independent of n. It's bounded independently of n. Ah, but so that means I control the exponential moments of any fluctuation. Instead of controlling it here by n, if the, if the test function is regular enough, I have upgraded this into a control by C. So well, this, is, this is not good, but what I have upgraded, and I should find my eraser. I have upgraded things into saying that the exponential moments of something like this thanks to the computation of this ratio of partition functions is bounded by a constant if xi is regular enough. Okay, but now I can bootstrap this information. I can go back to my calculation. This term, I already knew it was small. It was contributing uh, 1 over root n anyway. But the other term that was troubling me, I had a control by an order of a constant. But now I can upgrade this. And since I have essentially something of the form of exponential moments of a fluctuation, it's, it's essentially of that form. But it has a t in front. So the log of that. It's going to be bounded by CT. And this is like C over N. And so it goes to 0. And that finishes my proof, because once I put everything, all the pieces together, I find that this term, I can treat it as 1. And the Laplace transform of the fluctuations, I have computed them explicitly. The the, the, the log of them is going to converge, so this is going to be exponential m xi, sorry, exponential tau times m xi. This is my original term. And so I have found that the log of the expectation flux times xi is behaving like, so if you remember, there was a variance term which was like that. And there is this tau m xi plus little o of 1. And this is exactly what we needed to prove convergence to a Gaussian. Uh, to a Gaussian. So at this point, I if you have uh, infinite regularity on xi, you can actually bootstrap this procedure, and you can obtain a rate of convergence. So all these convergences, uh, you can make them uh, uh, you, you, you can sort of input the information you already got on the convergence of the exponential moments of the fluctuation to explicitly describe uh, what happens and obtain an expansion uh, in all orders of 1 over n. And the other thing is that, as Gaetan was uh, mentioning in his, in his talk, in fact, computing um, Laplace transforms of fluctuations or computing ratios of partition functions, we've seen it's essentially the same. Uh, and so if you want, you can also obtain expansions of the ratio of partition functions for two different potentials uh, by applying this method. And if you have 
as much regularity as you want, you'll be able to expand in powers of 1 over n. And this is what uh, Gaetan uh, Borot and Alice Guillonet uh, have done uh, with uh, an approach which is uh, ph philosophically similar, but uh, technically a little bit different. Um, OK, so I, I said that I have cheated because I have presented the proof to you in 1D. Uh, in fact, if you're in, if you're in 2D, uh, it's not it's not going as smoothly and the the place where it's difficult is when you're trying to compute the difference of the um of the um energies so i don't know if you remember at one point i was having to compute something like this All right you want to compute evaluate the difference between the energy of a, of a system of particles, of charges, and the transported system, where you move, you move everything by phi t. So in one day, I've, I've used the explicit form of f in this form to, to evaluate this, uh, this difference and to linearize it in t, obtaining these terms that involve these uh, psi of x minus psi of y over x minus y. But if you do that in 2D, the equivalent terms is uh, basically is going to be a psi of x minus psi of y scalar with x minus y divided by x minus y squared. And this term is not continuous. So it, it, there's rotations that happen near the diagonal. Uh, so it's not. Um, it's not uh, convenient to do it this way. Instead, what we do is we resort to the formulation in terms of the electric potentials that I presented uh, yesterday. So you express things in terms of a difference of something like this minus the original one. And you evaluate this difference. And in the end, to prove that the corresponding term that comes here is negligible, you you call the expansion of the partition function. So you have two ways of computing the expansion of the partition function. One way is to, to compute the ratio th in this way, but we have another way um, of computing it. So if you want, the kn vt divided by kn v naught has an expansion of the log of it has an expansion up to Cn that I mentioned in the first lecture with a constant here that is a little bit explicit. And this is obtained by uh, our other result with Thomas Leblay that I will present tomorrow. Um, so borrowing from that result and this expansion and the explicit dependence of C in the equilibrium measure, you have another way of computing this. And it allows you to show that this, uh, this harmful term is actually uh, well controlled. Um, OK, so I think it's, uh, it would be a good time to stop. If I remember, I may have some additional comments. But uh, I think I quoted everybody. It's a good time for lunch. Thank you. Any questions before lunch? Yes. I think it. I don't think it works, but uh, we can we can try to talk about it. I, I mean, typically the terms that you are obtain you're going to obtain in they are going to look like sines and cosines near when you look near the diagonal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's an interesting uh, thought, but okay. I'm I, I'm not sure it would work, but uh, we can we can talk about it.
Okay. So tomorrow, yeah, maybe I'll say. <laughs> tomorrow I will completely uh, switch um, from this topic, and um, and the goal will be to just describe a little bit uh, the the large deviation principle that you can get that for which the the as a byproduct you get this expansion of uh, partition functions in in any d. Okay. So if you didn't attend to today, which is not your case, obviously. Uh, <laughs> You can still come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take Sylvia again. <laughs>